This is your Tech News Briefing for Friday, December 16th. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. We're off to the races. In New York City, very good start from Cassidy. Absolutely flies off the line. And Van Dorn loses second place on the run down into the first corner. Onto the brakes, goes to Grassi. Up into second Except place, goes this to- race, Formula E's E-Prix in New York this past summer, might sound a little different from what you'd expect to hear. Terrible start from Pascal Verlein in the Porsche. He has lost ground. Sims has lost out to Robin Freitz. Because it's the sound of electric race cars. No vrooming gas engines here. Historically, the racetrack has played an important role in the development of modern cars. Rearview mirrors, seat belts, and anti-lock brakes all have their origins in race cars. And it's no different with today's electric models, especially as car companies work to address a key drawback of EVs, charging them. Our tech columnist Christopher Mims has been speaking to experts learning from the racetrack and even checking out the Speedway himself. And he joins me now. Hi, Christopher. Thanks for being here. Hey, Zoe. So, Christopher, you went to one of these Formula E races. What was it like? It's really enjoyable. It's a full-on race, but you're right there next to the track. You can get so much closer because these cars are almost whisper quiet. You know, their tires make more noise than their engines do, which are almost silent. So it's just this very intimate, very fast race experience. Okay, let's talk about how this technology gets out of Formula E and maybe on to our roads. Why do regular car companies care about developing these Formula E cars? I mean, do they learn anything from the process? A lot of what they learn from electric vehicles, believe it or not, is in the software and it's in how to manage energy. You know, the same things that you have to do to make sure that your car doesn't run out of energy on a a race, uh, you might want to do to make sure your car makes it to the next charging station. I spoke with Nissan's Thomas Volpe about this sort of thing. He manages the company's motorsports team, and here's what he told me. If you think about how much of the performance of an electric vehicle depends on software and how much easier can be transferred the learnings that we have behind the energy management, I mean, even a normal car, an electric vehicle can be utilized in a much more flexible way if you just change the software and the way the power is utilized by the car compared to an internal combustion engine that can be fine-tuned, but the power output is, is more rigid. A lot of what he's talking about is the fact that with an electric car, there's just so much more flexibility that can be achieved in software. So you can use code to make a car accelerate better or be better at regenerative braking or even accept charge faster uh, when you're trying to charge it at home. When it comes to something like the battery efficiency, apart from race car drivers, why does it matter if it takes a long time for EVs to charge? It really comes down to acceptance by the public. If it takes cars a long time to charge, people are really hesitant to buy them because they realize that they're not going to be great for road trips. And they might also say to themselves, hey, I'm one of the 37% of Americans that doesn't have a garage to park my car in at night. Where am I going to charge up and how long is it going to take? But there's actually another reason that I learned about when I spoke to Eric Waxman, who's the director of the Maryland Energy Innovation Institute at the University of Maryland. And just listen to this other reason that he gives. The other aspect is the greater the range of the batteries, right, of your electric vehicle is, the heavier the battery is. And you start using more and more of the energy to propel the weight of the battery. So the battery that charges faster doesn't need to get you as far on a single charge because stopping to charge it won't be nearly as much of a pain. Okay, so how do we make faster charging batteries then? A big part of what it will take to make faster charging batteries is better battery technology. Usually when we hear better battery tech, it means batteries that, you know, just can take you further. But this is innovation in a different direction. It's batteries that can accept charge more quickly. And there's a ton of innovations coming here in the next three to 10 years. There are uh, silicon in the anode instead of graphite, uh, which can accept the electrons a lot faster. There's also coming solid state batteries, which are so-called you know, lithium metal batteries, where there's no liquid in them at all. And these batteries could charge faster and they could also be a lot more energy dense. 
Let's talk about cost then. I mean, what would having these faster charging batteries mean for the cost of an electric vehicle overall? One of the key things to know about batteries these days is that the price per cell or per pack, which is what goes into the car, has stopped going down. So automakers can't count on cheaper batteries to make cheaper electric vehicles in the future. But if you could have just less batteries, maybe half as many batteries in a vehicle, because users find that acceptable because they can charge it so much more quickly, then it could cost, you know, six, ten thousand dollars less, maybe even more once you include the margin for the automaker. What is that going to mean in terms of the comparison in cost between an electric vehicle and a gas powered vehicle? Well, I actually put that question to Eric Waxman and here's what he said. In the future, the cost of electric cars could be less than the cost of cars today. Basically, the electric motor is less expensive than the internal combustion engine. There's no maintenance to speak of. And the primary difference is the cost of the batteries. If we had lower cost batteries, then the cost of electric vehicle would in fact be less than a current internal combustion engine vehicle today. I mean, so at the moment, a lot of electric vehicles are kind of the the realm of wealthier people. Would that change? And how quickly are we looking at that shift? This matters a lot because you got to keep in mind that worldwide there's 1.4 billion cars on Earth, and most of them are owned by people who can't afford a forty-five or fifty thousand dollar premium electric vehicle in the U.S., much less luxury. So, if we are going to shift the entire world's auto fleet to electric vehicles and make them accessible to everybody, they've got to fall in price a lot. They've got to be the same price as a gasoline vehicle, you know, rolling right off the showroom floor. Or hopefully in the future, they'll be less. And then it's a no-brainer to make that switch. One other issue here, we could get, you know, cheaper, faster charging batteries that make electric vehicles more acceptable to some consumers. But where do you charge them? Because we don't have a ton of charging infrastructure in this country, at least at the moment. So the infrastructure bill that passed in November 2021 includes $7.5 billion for new charging stations all across America. The eventual goal is 500,000 charging stations. Currently, the U.S. has about 50,000, and only about 5,000 are the fast charging stations that would be required to get vehicles to charge in a reasonable amount of time. So we have a long, long way to go in terms of building out a powerful and ubiquitous charging infrastructure that would enable us to have, you know, all of our vehicles charging quickly whenever we want. All right. That's our tech columnist, Christopher Mims. Christopher, thanks so much for bringing us this story. Zoe, always a pleasure. If you want to learn more about the developments of fast charging EV batteries and the role the racetrack played, check out Christopher's latest column this Saturday. And that's it for Tech News Briefing this week. Our producer is Julie Chang. We had production assistance from Ariana Osperu. Our executive producer is Chris Zinsley. And I'm your host, Zoe Thomas. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend. Thank you.